This morning we're talking with Ivan Sanderson, the gentleman that investigated the West Virginia monster. And we have Walter Rochette with us, and we also have Donald Cohn with us. Now, Hugh McPherson, who is the all-night man at the station in, I think it's Charlestown, West Virginia. Charlestown. Mm -hmm. He's been very interested in getting the facts about the famous West Virginia monster. I think Gray Barker was the author of a book they knew too much about flying saucers. And if I'm not mistaken, Ivan, you investigated the Gray. West Virginia monster. Gray and I were there at the same time, as matter of fact, along with a lot of other newspaper reporters. Well, now we're taping this portion of this morning show, and we're going to send this tape down to Hugh McPherson. Right. Incidentally, Hugh McPherson has a minor bird that works with him on the program. Oh, yes, uh, I know his name, and I know yeah. his work, too. The minor, a good minor bird, yeah. Well, supposing you tell us something about the West Virginia monster. Are you ready with the tape? Um, well, it's going right now. Uh-huh. Well, um, you would like to... Try and put it in a nutshell as follows, as I said before. First of all, uh, I went down there about five or six days after the occurrence took place at the request of the North American Newspaper Alliance, uh, for whom I do some reporting work and special re uh, representation, and also on behalf of True Magazine. It was Ken Purdy of True Magazine who, when running out of his office one day on some private business, uh, picked at random out of a mass of clippings that used to come to his desk every, every day a, a perfectly ridiculous statement that a 12-foot uh, green monster with red glowing eyes had been seen on a mountaintop at Fatwood uh, in, uh, um, I think it's Saxton County, isn't it? Uh, West Virginia. I didn't know I was going to be asked to tell you about this tonight, so if my names are wrong, forgive me. And he gave this report, Ken Purdy, to John Dubarry of True Magazine, who was their aviation editor and was interested in flying saucers and such, and said, get a hold of Ivan Sanderson, have him get down there and see what this is all about. Ken Purdy had an absolute genius of picking a news story. So I was rung up and asked to go down. So my assistant, uh, Eddie Schoenenberger, and I, we jumped in an old taxi cab we had at the time, and we, we took off. I may say that on the way down, we went through the worst rainstorm that I have witnessed anywhere in the world. And I've lived in Assam, and I've lived in on right on Cape Debuncher in West Africa, which are the two points of highest rainfall in the world, but I have never seen rain like we had on the, um, on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Well, we rolled into Flatwoods the next morning. That's Flatwoods, West Virginia? Yeah. Ivan? Saxton County, I think, S-A-X-T-O-N <coughs> County, West Virginia. It's in the mountains. It is north of Charleston, uh, West Virginia. How do the roads there compare with those in Europe? Uh, what, in the hills? Mm. Oh, excellent. They have uh, very good motor roads going through. Of course, there are an enormous number of little um, um, what you call it, roads, uh, uh, dirt roads going up into the hills because there's been extensive mining throughout that entire area. If you fly over it, you will see uh, mine heads and mine shafts everywhere, and the tops of these, of these wooded hills are uh, completely covered with these dirt roads. Well, to make a long story short, this is what we found out during our investigations. There were a number of, there were 14, all told, a uh, number of young, uh, young people, uh, kids and... Uh, up to the age of 14, were playing football on a small um, field in the bottom of a little valley in the village of Flatwood. The village of Flatwood is at one end of this little valley. It's ringed around by mountains, as uh, you down there will probably know better than I do, uh, or our other listeners up here. Now, through this valley runs a road, a blacktop road, going from north to south, also a railway line, a railway track. And at the opposite end of this little valley to the village, is a small um, railroad station. And there is a dirt road that crosses the rail tracks uh, leading off the, off the blacktop just by that rail station, then curves up round the back of one of these mountains and uh, sort of peters out uh, at a field. And up that road, stuck on the side of this hill, I would say, a very stony hill, are a number of uh, dwellings. Up on the top, at the back of the mountain, there are four or five rather larger houses. One of those houses is occupied by a family by the name of May. Uh, the lady, Mrs. May, if I remember right, is principally concerned in this affair. These kids were playing uh, just before sundown, uh, down on this field at the bottom of the village. And one of the kids looked up, and one of the little ones, uh, I differentiate between kids and young people, uh, say kids, the five, six, seven-year-olds, and the young people above that, you see. But one of the kids looked up, and he said, uh, in so many words, what on earth is that? 
And they all looked around, and round, round the edge of a hill, uh, behind the village, the north of the village, uh, but lower than the peak of that hill, or the one opposite it, came a, a pear-shaped glowing red object which was pulsing from cherry red to bright orange, according to all the witnesses. It was traveling blunt end first. It traveled quite slowly across the valley over their heads and just managed to top the mountain on the other side, or the hill on the other side of the valley, which is that hill behind which there are these dwellings of which I spoke a moment ago. Well, the kids all said, um, as I say, gee, what was that? And one of the elder boys, whose name was Nun, a very, very intelligent boy of, eight, of 14 years old, had uh, remembered that at school they had been asked if they saw a meteor or anything like that and saw anything fall from the sky, that, that the geological survey would be interested in getting uh, the remains of it or anything that was found on the ground. And he said, come on, that may be a bolide or something, and something looks as if it's landed behind that hill, because I must point out, yes, I'm sorry, that the kids all state categorically that this object, this large glowing object, which appeared to be about the size of a house, seemed to pause when it topped the hill, and then to sink, instead of going on, down in the sort of trajectory, it stopped and sank slowly down behind the hill, and they could see this light pulsing behind the crest of the hill. And none said, uh, the 14-year-old said, come on, let's run up there, uh, something may have landed, and we may be able to get something to the geological survey, which I think is pretty bright and intelligent. So the kids ran up the blacktop, taking a few minutes, turned left on the dirt road, crossed the railway track, went up around behind the hill, and as they run between the, ran between the houses, several of the people would come out on the verandas, and they said, what's going on? And one of the younger kids said, um, a flying saucer has landed, uh, picking up, I mean, he, 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 one of the, the little ones, you see. Mrs. May and a young man aged 18, who had just joined the National Guard, I think, or, or the services or something, were sort of visiting with her. Some other people came out, and they grabbed a big flashlight, because it was just getting dark, and they saw this huge thing lying in the field, about two fields away, up by the crest. So they all gathered together. Uh, there were, in the end, I'm sorry, I was wrong in saying there were 14 kids playing. The total party in the end was 14. So there must have been, there was uh, May, Mrs. May and the young man, and then there were 11 kids, and then there was a little one, a little five-year-old, also a named Nun, if I remember her right, who was at one of the houses, and he tagged along behind, and to me, he is one of the most important witnesses in the whole case, because of his extraordinary honesty. When we asked him certain things, he said, but mister, I couldn't see, I'm too, too low down. There was grass <laughs> in between me. I mean, uh, these kids are the most straightforward, honest witnesses I've ever known. However, they all started out, and they ran up the ridge where there's a path. Pardon they, me, didn't the little boy have his dog with him? Well, a dog, a collie dog belonging to another house, not Mrs. May, uh, nor, nor the 18-year-old, but there was a collie-like dog that was there. Yes, thank you, John, for reminding me of that. It's a very important thing in the case. It started off with them. Well, they came to a gate which was, which was chained, uh, and they unchained it, but being good country folk, when they'd gone through the gate, they rechained the gate. It's rather you know the height point. of that fence? That, that, uh, that gate was, a, I think, a five bar, but it was up almost by my neck, and I'm exactly six foot tall. It was a uh, high gate. You were actually down there after this event took place. I, we arrived you investigated there. investigated it. Every point of it. With Gray Barker. Gray Barker arrived while we were there, but we had some other friends, some scientists up from Monsanto Chemical, one of whom was a great uh, photographer, Walter. And I photographed every single thing of this. We mapped it and surveyed it. We searched the ground almost inch by inch. And uh, as the as these uh, facts fall into place, I'll I'll tell you all of them. But this gate is important. It was a high gate, and they rechained it, and they went on up this path. By which time it was very nearly dark, and they turned the flash on. The dog by this time had run ahead. Now what they what they saw up there, they were within, I mean, they were within, within paces of this thing. And I think enormous fortitude was shown by those people in walking up to a completely unknown object, which they pointed out to me a house, an outhouse, sort of little barn. And I said, how big was it? And they said, about that size. We measured that little two-story barn, but a small one, it was 22 foot high. They said this thing had landed with the nose, the blunt end down, so it formed not exactly a pair, but it was more like a, um, an ace of spades, sort of standing up in the field, mm -hmm. sticking up. And they walked up to within certainly 50 paces of it, according to their description. At which time it was standing upright and making no noise, but was, was pulsing with very bright light from cherry red to very pale orange. 
uh, I'll jump ahead of my story for a minute and say it wasn't until way at the end when we had questioned all these people, or at least all the kids, together in various combinations of two, three, four, and five, and singly, and then mixed them up again, and we, for three days we went on, and they never deviated from their stories one single iota. And if you can tell me that a bunch of 12 kids can get together and make up a lie and stick to it for 10 days under the most grueling uh, circumstances because there were professional reporters there. Did you interrogate them individually? Individually, in, in combinations of different twos mm -hmm. and threes and fours and all together and over three days and there was never in the evidence. We have it taped and we have it written down. There was never a mistake. Some added a few touches which were not exaggerations. Some of them uh, became a little doubtful as to whether it was just, as they said, the first time or the second, but they never deviated in their overall story. And I think that's very, very a powerful factor uh, in evaluating the whole thing. And it wasn't until right at the end that one of the younger kids, I don't remember which one now, I said to him, well, weren't you frightened of being burnt with this thing? He said, but, mister, it wasn't hot. We'd naturally, everybody had supposed that because of this tremendous light that the thing was hot and was pulsing. Oh, no, no, no. He said, it's like, um, like a neon sign. He said, it's not hot. It wasn't hot. And they had kept on saying that it was black. And I said, well, if it was pulsing cherry red to orange, how do you say it's black? And they said, well, it was obviously a black object which was giving out this light. All right. Well, they go along, they lit the flash. The dog had run ahead. And all around this object, there was a thick mist, looked like a ground mist, a patch of it, lying on the side of the hill. Now, you do get these patches of mist uh, at sundown, sometimes in little coals up on the hill. And they had assumed that it was that. Well, they stratify, Ivan. They, they very seldom lie along the side of a hill, not as much as they would on a definite strata. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 excuse no. me. In, in that climate, uh, especially after those tremendously heavy rains, I have seen these little sort of scooped out coals on the side of a hill actually filled with mist, and it's sort of spilling over the edge, almost like it was treacle. Well, but actually, it holds there like water would with a definite top level, doesn't it? No, it's stuck on the side in some cases. Is that you right? get a patch right over an area where the soil may be particularly moist, and just for a few minutes while it's coming out at sundown, you get a, just a, like a round blob on the side, and they're used to that, and they thought that's what it was. But the dog ran into this mist, going barking at this object, according to their story. He immediately set up a howl and took off practically with the speed of the light down to the village and was subsequently found having vomited all over a veranda and di subsequently died. Um, now, in other words, evidence of poison. Yeah, leave that aside for the moment. In other words, it was a gas. They said there was a ghastly smell, and this is what was in the report, a ghastly smell of hot molten metal. And they got the smell, although only one of them bent down and got his head in the gas. And that was this... One of the youngsters? No, the 18-year-old. The 18-year-old boy. Yes, I have mm -hmm. to skip ahead of my story because this is what happened. They had this, lit this flash. They were looking at the object, and then suddenly one of the kids behind said, look, up in the tree. Now, there was one <coughs> oak tree growing isolated right on the top of the ridge. And there's a little pathway at the bottom. This oak tree was on a bank, a three-foot bank on the left of the pathway. The big object was a little bit further down the hill to the right, if you follow me. This is to the left. The first uh, branch going out of the oak tree, which was clear branch, when measured from the underneath of the branch to the, to the path on which they were standing, was 12 foot 6 inches about. Now, they pointed, this kid pointed up to this branch, and underneath the branch, uh, apparently suspended in the air, was a creature or a thing or an object about the size of a very heavy set man, but obviously contained in some kind of suit or what looks from their drawings, their composite drawing, they all did sketches, and we put a composite of it, which looks exactly like one of the most modern naval diving uh, suits, which is solid. The person is inside, it has a pair of artificial arms in front that you can crank. The head goes into a headpiece, which has a, a glass plate in the front, a uh, silicon glass plate, and it's got uh, lights in it so that you can see in the dark. And the whole thing is, is uh, suspended in water, mostly by gas tanks, so that there's no great weight on the wire, so the wire that lets it down is nothing much more than an anchor and has the telephone cable and so on going. Now, this thing was for all the world like that in the drawings. Um, at first, they thought it was a 12-foot giant thing standing there because the bottom half of it, if it had any, was lost behind a lot of little uh, of tall grass and uh, briars and well, stuff. this mist, too, covered it. No, it? the mist was down to the right by the big object. Down to the right. This was perfectly mm -hmm. clear up to the left on this little bank. And there was first the bank, and then all this, this vegetation, this herbage growing on it. And this thing 
was sticking out of the top of the herbage, but underneath the first limb of the tree. You follow me? Uh, they thought it was a coon at first because they saw what they thought were two eyes. They described them as being pale blue, uh, held close together, and like very dim flashlight beams. But coming out of the plate glass window on the front of the head of this whatever it was, they were fixed beams. But the thing was turning slowly around, waving from left to right and right to left, as if it was searching the horizon with these beams. I may interject here that that particular point is the highest in the whole area, and standing where that object was, you can see 14 light beacons scattered over the mountains, the way over West Virginia and down into Virginia and right back up the other side. Um, in other words, it, it, somebody suggested that this thing was looking for its colleagues or was looking to find out where it was. But apparently when the flashlight came on, the object tilted over so that these two little beams came down and concentrated on them and then immediately began to, began to silently drift through the air sort of um, in a half circle towards them and around to the left to go down from its left to go down towards the big pulsing object, the red thing that was lying in the field. So scared were they when this tremendous thing came towards them, which was of a sort of aluminum gray color, but reflecting uh, the color of the bushes and such, which gave the idea of greenness, because one of little men, green men always, and that's part of the newspaper edition. They were so scared, the guy dropped the flash, and he bent over to pick it up, and in doing so, he got his head into this, into this ground mist. Well, uh, to jump ahead again, he became so violently ill, as a result, they called a doctor half an hour later down to the house, and went, uh, didn't use a stomach pump, but everything short of it, and also, it seemed to have had an extraordinary psychological effect on him because he was a, a fine, upstanding young man. But he absolutely and positively refused, even the next day, to go back up that hill. It seemed, and he was in a frightful state that night. The doctor was really worried about him. He was completely knocked out. However, but of course, they all took off. And I don't blame them when this thing started to sail through the air towards them. How about the gate? Well, I know, John, you like the gate part. <laughs> I got this from the littlest one of all. A little, I think his name was Johnny Nunn. Uh, I was asking them at various points, well, what happened when you came to the gate? And, uh, no, not that kind of gate at all. This was a five-barred gate, and, a, and there was the space between the hunks of wood was certainly not more than a, a foot. About Twelve inches. Twelve mm -hmm. inches. Mm -hmm. I said, well, well, what happened when you came to the gate? And he said, well, I don't know, don't rightly know, mister. He said, I didn't try the gate. He said, I went under the hedge because I'm small. But he said, I know that Mrs. May took it in one. She went clean over the top. <laughs> and he said, some of them, I think, went through the gate, mister. Most of them couldn't tell at that point what they had done. But anyhow, they cleared the gate in one. The Olympics missed some good candidates. They sure did. <laughs> but it would be impossible to take the time to open up the gate again. Well, they weren't taking time, brother. Not, not then. They were making time. They weren't taking it. And they were right back down to the house. Well, uh... To finish off this part of the story, we only found, much later on, after a considerable amount of questioning all over the district, we found a farmer who lived on a mountain, no, on a mountain, on a, on a hill, about three miles away to the southeast, who was the only person who had had a pair of binoculars on this object. He thought that the house was on fire, uh, but it began to look funny, and he couldn't see very well. It was about three mountain peaks or three hill peaks away. So he went inside, he got out an old pair of binoculars, which he showed me. They were uh, pre-World War I. And he is the only person we know who's able to state or make any statement as to what happened to that great big object. What happened to the little one, I don't know. It, it looked, looked to everybody as if it was trying to get back into the big one. Uh, but he watched the big object, and he, he said that for a matter of 10 to 15 minutes, it continued to pulse. And it... Uh, it pulsed the same colors, but getting redder and redder and weaker and weaker amount of light. And he felt very sure that the whole object itself was diminishing in size. And he said it finally disappeared about 20 minutes later in a pinpoint of light, and then it was complete darkness. Now, when the, the gang who had been up to it got back down to the houses, uh, they, uh, a lot of people began to gather. There was great rumpus. They sent for a doctor, and they tried to... They, there was a telephone at one of the houses, and they telephoned for the local police to come. But the local police were already out investigating something else that I shall just end off with in a moment. Uh, they called a lot of the men together, and they got shotguns, and they formed a posse, and they went up to investigate. At least they said they did. They were back in extremely short order, stating categorically that they could find nothing. But they did not get going for at least half an hour 
after the incident. Uh, by which time, according to this farmer, this thing had winked out. It did not go away. It had just disappeared in situ. Therefore, they may have been perfectly honest in saying that they had not seen anything. And I think they may have been honest in saying that they went up there because they did report this perfectly ghastly and nauseating smell of molten metal. It's peculiar. Now, where was the road patrol? This is what we found out when we got there. That's that side of the story. We then started asking around all over the district, the tape recorder and such, did you see the thing? And they all said, oh, that there flying saucer, ha, ha, ha. No, but we saw the meteor. Well, then we started mapping. We had a big aerial map of the whole area, and we started mapping where they, at what time they said they saw said meteor. And then we came up with one very interesting discovery. There had not been one object, there had been six. Uh, six different objects? Six identical? Identical. But, but different objects. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. They were all traveling, let us say, to make it perfectly simple, from about north to south. The one on the east side was spotted all along a line by about 30, 40 people. It passed right over the Sutton Airport and was then reported during that night all the way down to Alabama in a perfectly straight line, according to what newspaper and other reports we could get. That was just one of them? That was the most easternmost of them. They were traveling along a straight front, almost exactly five of our miles apart. The only time they had appeared to have deviated from that from the reports was when they went around a hill or a mountain. But they were keeping on a steady course from north to south, traveling not too fast. I should imagine by, we asked the kids, Put your finger in the air and pass it from left to right. Show us how fast, it, uh, how long it took to get across Flatwoods. And it took... Uh, well, that would be about jet speed, as you demonstrated here. Uh, oh, no, sir. Mm -hmm. Jets would go <laughs> gone like that. Depends Don't on their altitude. Yeah, this thing was not more than 200 foot up from where they were standing. And it took, I would say, radio time uh, um, 25 seconds to pass from the hill... Uh, 45 degree angle from there to there. No, but, but the way they've showed it, it was good. they were going pretty slowly. There was a steady speed. All right, eastern one, number one, went straight on down, got away. Number two was this flatwood one that landed. I call that a landing. Number three came around a hill, went over a, a road, and crashed into the side of a mountain. That was Gray Barker and I, and Eddie went up and investigated that. And that's where we found this peculiar stuff. Was the ground seared at that point? Well, I, if I may leave that for a moment, I'll come to it. Number three crashed on, on, a, on another mountain top on the land of two remarkable young men who have farmed their farm all their lives, although they are both cripples. Uh, they do it all by tractor. But they cannot farm the knolls on their upland because it's full of rocks and so on. They can't get in. So they farm. So they, can, they couldn't persuade anybody to go and investigate this knoll where they had seen this, this one land for their eyes. The, that's number four. Number five blew up in the sky right in front of four members, six members of our National Caving Society, Cave Exploration Society, um, at the house of which people called the McLeans. They were sitting on the veranda after having been out on a caving expedition, and they saw this thing come around the mountains, were amazed, and it blew up right over some fields. And uh, Mrs. Williams, one of the members uh, who were there, told me afterwards with complete innocence that a lot of kind of ashes shot out of it and scattered all over the land. I said to him, and you're supposed to be a geologist, and you didn't even go over to pick up some. <laughs> and number six, number six missed and went right on and was seen all the way down in a parallel line uh, to Alabama almost as well. So uh, one went on, two landed, three crashed into this mountain top, uh, four crashed into a mountain top, five blew up in the air, and six got away. There's some very good reason for that. Now, Sounds like a series of unguided missiles, but doesn't it? <laughs> but except for this one, the landing one, if it was a missile, if it had missed that mountain top, which it did, it would have sailed right on over the next valley and hit the next hill on the side. But it didn't. It had stopped and landed. And I know that it landed because where it landed, it had pushed a, it had pushed a, um, a circular depression into the ground, but exactly vertical to the center of the earth. Do you see what I mean? I see. Not a, a slosh downwards. In other words, it wasn't a glancing blow. It was a direct it rest. come down and it would have been weight, and a lot of weight, because the grass there was an overgrown field and it was knee high, I mean waist high, and full of little twigs and bushes. All that was completely flattened. The ground itself was flattened and there were some considerable stones, not boulders, but stones, the size of a man's head lying, and then they'd been pushed right down into the ground. 
Well, this also, thing had considerable mass and weight then. Definitely. And also at, um, at the three points, equidistant around it, there were three holes jammed into the ground at the edge of the circle, which looked exactly as if a cart horse with a foot, uh, with, a, with a hoof about two foot across, had been jammed down into the ground. As if a tri it had stood on a tripod, that's what it looked like. Exactly similar marks we found up uh, where number three crashed. Um, there were five of us, Eddie Schoenenberger, Gray Barker, uh, Raymond Walters, and one other gentleman from Monsanto and myself. We had reports of this, of very reliable, I have a lot of time to go into. We searched this mountain, uh, mountainside on our hands and knees, clawing our way up because it was so steep. We found nothing until we got to the top. And over the top, there was a little swamp up there uh, with small trees behind the big forest, tall trees. And in there, I found a huge, like a skid mark, which had knocked these bushes down. And there, were, there was a depression in that, and also two of these tremendous hoof-like things pushed into the ground. Uh, and beyond it, a whole mass of little pieces, little coils of white plastic-like material scattered all over the ground. I'll tell you about that. Ivan, go going back to the depression, how large was that depression? Well, the depression itself was about uh, 15 foot across, we measured it, 15 or 16 foot. But you couldn't, of course, tell exactly when it ran out to the side because it was a, a, a dish-shaped depression, a sort of shaped depression. The, the reason I asked, are you, are you familiar with the experimental work that uh, Mr. Monsieur Kawanda is now doing in Canada? What, on, on, on the discs? Yes. Uh, well, I've read something about it, but I don't know anything about... Uh, would it have any connection with such things? Well, I'm just wondering if it, it could have been experimented on. Well, he's, he's well, been working at it for some time. Yes, that's true. But wait, before we get on to that, let me just put our report from down there, and then I'd like to just pick that up, because there's a nasty one. Um, and then that. Uh, I don't think those machines are made to dissolve, are they? Not quite. No. <laughs> <laughs> to the contrary. <laughs> Nor also do they um, give out with some kind of plastic or something. No, they give out with flame. With flame, too, yeah. Well, this was definitely coal if these proportions would be believed. In each case, incidentally, because uh, number three here, he thought... Uh, the fellow who saw it, he thought that this was a flaming aeroplane came around the, came around the corner of the hill. This one we, we investigated. Well, anyhow, uh, to conclude this part, uh, Eddie Schoenenberger happened to be looked back up at the trees from the direction in which number three had come before it had apparently crashed in the swamp. And he, he said, look at that. And there was a whole treetop knocked off and several other branches all recently shattered. You always make a hole through the top of the tree. Was there any odor around there? No, because we were five, six days off. This was about a week after the other one had occurred. Because well, wasn't there, uh, I think I heard that there was the local editor of the newspaper or one of the members of the police department. Oh, he went over and got down on the ground on all fours, and he noticed that there was still some stench remaining there. As a matter of fact, the first of all, the posse, the people reported it, in fact. Then the posse went up, and they were so nauseated they wanted to get out of there as quick as possible, and they said it was absolutely overpowering. In the meantime, the, uh, the road patrol was unable to come because they were investigating number three. But the local police arrived from um, uh, Braxton County, it's not Braxton County, I'm sorry, from, from the town of Sutton. They got down on their hands and knees. They didn't have to. They noticed the smell. And the uh, very charming gentleman I met down there, the... Um, uh, the owner of the uh, Republican paper, there's two, is a Republican and Democratic paper. The uh, head of the Democratic paper is deeply interested in this, and he brought Mrs. May and uh, the young fellow whose name I can't remember up to New York for a, for a show, I think, with Ed Sullivan or something here on this. Um, and they were gone while we were down there. But this other gentleman had personally been up there that night, because he's very, very much alive to, to local affairs and happenings, and he was up there right smart during the night, and he smelt it too. But the next morning, there was a lot of confusion. There's always red herrings drawn across these things. A lot of people started turning up. And they said that the grass there was covered with oil. Well, it wasn't. Um, the all the grass there is covered with a kind of oil. It's coil oil grass or tar grass. You can pass your hand over a whip of it when it's growing and pull it up, and your hand will be sticky afterwards and has a rather lovely aromatic smell. That, I am assured by all the local people, they had nothing whatsoever to do with this perfectly ghastly stench which had occurred from this, from this uh, plane, uh, this uh, thing or whatever it was that landed. Well, just to, to, um, to round up this whole thing, Walter, 
and for the benefit of our friends down there who want to hear this report on tape, uh, there are certain aspects of the whole um, uh, phenomena which are of great interest, and that is this, that at that particular time, which was September, I think 1953, or 52, I can't remember, uh, there had been some enormous forest fires in Texas, uh, Louisiana, Alabama. And we were receiving in New York here even a very high smoke count in the air. In fact, we had a haze, you recall it, mm -hmm. and we had white ash land. Point number one. Point number two on this particular score, which all of which was pointed out to me by the chemist down there, uh, that block of hills over which these objects came looked down into a series of valleys running parallel. And those valleys are filled with coal mines which are belching smoke all the time. Monsanto chemical plant and other enormous chemical plants and other installations for which that part of the, of the country is famous. Belching smoke and carbonaceous gases of all kinds. The wind happened to be blowing straight up these valleys up this mountain. There was the smoke from the forest fires, there was all this accumulation. And there was a barrier of carbonaceously filled air <coughs> rising at the heads of these valleys. But Object number one and object number six were to the left and right of that area. And they seemed to have got away. And as it was pointed out to me that all the others, it looked as if as soon as they hit an, a highly polluted atmosphere, uh, something went wrong with either if they were animals, their breeding, if they were machines with their air intake, or some other words, that if they are extraterrestrial creatures of one kind or another, they were apparently doing a swoop down into our atmosphere to take a look, see, and then go in formation and go on up again. And what actually happened was they hit some of the wrong kind of air and something went wrong with them. They went out of control. That was one who was able to land and have a look around and see what had happened to his colleagues or where he was. Numbers two and three um, hit hills, got out of control, and number, and number five, number three and four, and number five blew up in the air. Come um, to the end of what I had to say, really. There's an enormous amount more to it which I could go on almost indefinitely, but I think that's enough detail for, for anybody to be asked to absorb at one go. Uh, I, my personal opinion I'd just like to throw in is that, that those, um, none of those people were telling lies, uh, those from Flatwoods especially, that the 400 odd other people whom we interviewed, including the young man who reported to the police um, number three incident, the crash, and those young farmers were certainly not, not lying. They were a highly skeptical group. They did not believe in flying saucers if they'd heard of them. Uh, but they did say that there were these objects in the sky. They had their times down pat. I mean, we'd say, well, what time was it? they said, well, let me see now. Dawn comes and so on. I used to put my porch light on and so on, so that would make it. And they'd pin it down within a minute. And they all jived all over. And uh, their descriptions gave exactly the course of these things on an aerial map. And I don't think those people were lying. I do think there were those six objects there. But what they were, of course, I have the foggiest notion. The last payoff was John Lee. But we did have this funny white stuff analyzed. My friends took it down to the, uh, one of the labs in Monsanto, and they couldn't be much better there. They had this numerous uh, spectros, spectrographic analysis machinery. They were unable to find out what it was. It seemed to be a, uh, of a plastic nature, but to be of an organic structure. The only thing they could think was that it looked more like a, the dried up skin of a snake's egg than anything else. Howsoever, one of the lab assistants down there managed to soften it up. They've been trying to soften it up in any, everything. He said, why don't you try water? Which they did. <laughs> and one of, these little, one of these little rolls of stuff, which were only about the size of my little finger, when stretched out, measured nine and a half inches. And I would like to know what snake's egg found in the United States or anywhere else uh, from which you could get a strip nine and a half inches long. Uh, the parting shot was a humorous one made by John DuBarry. When I told him about all this, he said, uh-oh. Perhaps they were space people, but perhaps they're reptiles and were looking for somewhere to lay an egg. Well, our thanks uh, to Avin Sanderson and also Long John Nibble. This is a program that was made in uh, about 1953, uh, recapturing the investigation that Avin made of the Braxton County Monster in September of 1952. Ivan Sanderson, the famous author, world famous traveler, geologist, biologist, and has written many books about the unexplained, unidentified flying objects and many other things. He did this story for True Magazine at that time and the North American newspaper Alive. They did this program on WOR in New York City. Long John Neville show at that time for our program, which we were doing here in Charleston on the all-night program. 
This was an answer to a group of students at Morris Harvey College and Tom Baumgartner and other people would like us to repeat the famous Braxton County Monster at Flatwoods, West Virginia in September 1952. Thank you for listening. Good night to all. I haven't heard much about the Flatwoods Monster case. As I was growing up in ufology, I first got interested in 1958, and I'd heard about it and read about it in some encyclopedias and so forth. But it was only when Frank Faschino called me to appear at their 50th anniversary celebration in Flatwoods that I looked a lot more closely to see what do I want to get involved with here. I mean, is this real? Is it not real? Is, is it just a story? I was very impressed with what I found. So I agreed to go down there, and I was astonished in talking with Frank, and he was sending me material, and we spent time together at the 50th anniversary, to see the enormous amount of information he had collected. And when talking to the witnesses, I, mean, I believe you have to go to the site if you're going to learn something useful about a case. It's very helpful. So with Flatwoods, being able to walk the walk, that the kids took going up the hill to see the big tree, to see the area where the saucer had landed up above. As soon as you saw those things, you, you've got a very important context for the story. And that's what had been there. It was the highest place in the area. So whoever was running the darn thing would look around and say, hey, we'd better put it down there. There's no place else. We're in bad trouble otherwise. So that made sense. That place made absolute sense. And then when you go up the hill to go past the tree, what's left of it, the, the family, the people had gone up past and the monster came out from, then you can again understand they're going up there to see what's up there. They have no expectation at all of running into something over here, especially some, some monster, some different thing, some totally unexpected thing. And so when you start looking at this, and you talk to the witnesses, and you find out that the kids got sick, got a whiff of this crazy gas or oil or whatever it was, maybe the two together, uh, and how they understood it could make kids sick. And the kids were sick all night long. The reporter found that out. When you hear about what uh, the National Guard guy, uh, Dale Levitt, found, it begins to really pile up facts and data and information. And then when I read the Air Force explanation, gee, no surprise there, it was just a meteor. Well, meteors have certain properties. They move very rapidly. When they hit the ground, there's a big noise and usually a big hole in the ground, and there are remnants of the meteor. None of these hold true. Meteors don't circle around a city and come down and land. You could say, well, it just went down the other side, but that wasn't what the people perceived. And when you hear the explanation, not only was it a meteor up there, although there's not the slightest bit of evidence that there was, and if you look at the meteor compilations for that year, no Flatwoods meteor, and when you hear about the monster and then the stupid explanation that it was an owl, I mean, a big owl, real big owl, and if the kid's getting sick, uh, was because they were frightened. None of that makes any sense. Look at that. Here's the monster owl. Here's the monster. You know how high the branch was up here when the skeptics put out drawings? Of course, they got the branch down here. But the object couldn't have moved out if there was a branch in the way. It went under the branch that was maybe 12 feet off the ground. So, I don't know what this thing was. I suspect it was protective gear being run by somebody, maybe even remotely. And these seem to be antennas. Now, people were misled by the initial drawings that were put together uh, as to what this was. But it's remarkable when you look at the five drawings made by the five kids who were up there and the local reporter had each kid do it separately. And you see how alike they were. Standard legal procedures say if five people describe something the same way, then 
they're probably describing the same thing. And, you know, this is impressive for five different kids. And this is peculiar. Nobody's ever reported a, a cowl like a fair, like ace of spades, you know, a spade behind something. Uh, this is not like they copied it from a science fiction magazine. So you have an honest reporter who actually was willing to go on television with the kids and Mrs. May, primary witness. Now, I was favorably impressed with the witnesses, too. I get a real kick out of the people who attack witnesses but don't talk to them. Make up explanations. You know, they were just seeking attention. They wanted to be somebody. The attention UFO witnesses get is not usually very pleasant. Especially in a small town. They get laughed at by the people in the community. These kids had nothing to gain. Mrs. May had nothing to gain. Oh, they went on television. Big deal. They were being accommodating to a local reporter, Mr. Stewart. And when you attack the people's credibility without giving any good reason for doing so, and when you ignore the data, and when you refuse to go to the site to see things firsthand or to talk to the firsthand witnesses, that's what Dr. Joe Nickel did with regard to this case. He was in Flatwoods, but he didn't go up to see the hill or the gully where the thing moved down. And he didn't talk to the witnesses, and he didn't go to the tree. What kind of investigation is that? One of the major contributions Frank Machino has made to the investigation of the Flatwoods Monster case is to dig out the Blue Book files. Difficult as it was, they were hard to read. But you look at all the witness testimony from that time. You know, people saying it was not a meteor. I have seen meteors. Uh, People who haven't seen meteors might think it was, but I have seen meteors is clearly being flown. That's a quote from a witness. Obviously, the craft was in trouble, or it wouldn't have come down up there. They seemed, saw it as kind of burning. So you got to go down, cool it off. It, it's amazing uh, out there on the site, you see how steep the gully is. The terrain is rugged. It's not gently sloping hills. The thing slid on down, this object went back there, and the whole thing took off sometime later. Meanwhile, lots of information was collected, which we had never seen. And Dale Levitt pointed out he never got any feedback on the stuff that he sent in. He sent in samples of the liquid, samples of the metal. Nobody knows what happened to it, where it went, and what the results were. And that's what I think happened here. And I think the government was, the guys on the inside at the hub, were very much concerned about what this meant. In the first place, people were scared all the pieces. Monster, that conjures up all kinds of things. And in the second place, what does this mean? Are these guys here to destroy us? Were they getting ready to attack? You know, the imagination plays tricks. And if you talk about a 12-foot high monster, that is scary. And so you can understand the government's concern with not making any more out of this story than they had to. It's part of the job of the government to prevent public panic about things, to tamp down too much excitement, because it gets in the way of getting rational things done. So I'm not blaming the government entirely for lying about this event. What are they going to say? That wouldn't scare the heck out of people. Are they going to tell you about all the other sightings that night? Of craft moving across the country from the East Coast over? Don't think so. But Frank Faschino has collected the stories from the newspapers all over the East. And it is clear there were lots and lots of sightings of truly unidentified flying objects that were not meteors. So Flatwoods is a good, solid case. Frank Faschino has collected more data on that case than has been collected in any other case that I'm aware of. And I've been on Roswell for 25 years. Frank has found the gold.